This is the JWN Podcast. Angel Bond spent her whole life looking for ways to help other people. Through an unbelievable journey early on in her life that took her around the world, she eventually stopped long enough to find her musical voice on stage performing as the lead singer of the band Cusses. The best word to describe their live show is powerful. It's something you have to see to believe. But what's even more powerful is hearing Angel's story that has led her to come face to face with the threat of losing her ability to sing. Angel is a selfless and kind soul who's coming to grips with the ideas of self-care at a time when the urge to help others is stronger than ever. So without further ado, here's Angel Bond. Let's start from the beginning. Let's start from you getting into music. Because okay. the way I was introduced to you guys as a band, I saw the the finished product of a band that's you know very established with itself, has figured out a sound and has a stage mm-hmm. presence, a power. <laughs> and if I were to describe the first time I saw you guys, it was like getting kicked in the head and then <laughs> getting up and asking for another kick. <laughs> like it, it was so powerful. It was such oh, an intense experience. And, and um, there was something about the chemistry between the three of you at that time. Yes. The drums were like insane, like mm-hmm. like Animal with like, you know, Animal from the Muppets style That's of one just- of his favorites. Yeah, just bashing <laughs> the drums, but like playing it almost melodically, you know? Yeah. Well, John Bonham and, and Animal are his two heroes, so thanks. <laughs> And then you had the other Brian right. on guitar, who was just like playing three guitars worth of uh, guitar sound coming out of one instrument. Yeah. <laughs> and then you had Angel Bond, <laughs> front and center, getting in the audience, uh, making every single person in that crowd feel like they were the only person in the room. Oh, thank you. So tell me, how did you get to that point? Well, it's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, it took a long time. I, I feel like I'm a, a little bit of a late bloomer um, in that sense because um, I knew it was something I always wanted to do since I was younger. I was just very shy about it and had a lot of, you know, that self-doubt. My, my father is a musician, still is. You know, I lived with him every other year growing up. And in his household, he, he was the band leader. He had the studio in the, either in the basement in a bedroom or the garage, wherever we were living. So I always had a rock band in my house, you know. Where did you grow up? Where was this? Okay, well, so my parents, they split up when I was very young. And um, my mother bounced around a little bit. But my, my father stayed in the southern region. He was in Bristol, Virginia. It's on the, the Virginia-Tennessee border. And um, my mother moved back up north to her family in the Boston area. And they decided to do a, a year a year custody deal. So every year, every other year, I would move from Boston to Bristol area. That, those were kind of the main areas that I grew up in, the North Shore of Boston and, and um, Southern Virginia, Tennessee. Wow. So all the even years were up north, all the odd years were, I went to three different high schools, you know, very different, um, cultures different um you think (laughs) very different parts of the world definitely different parts of america so that was that really shaped i think a lot of of who i am today um i started you know with i love music obviously my mom loved music but she kind of she was into the motown um and classical um patsy klein kind of world and my dad was really into rock and blues um, and also introduced me to, you know, like the greats of like Pink Floyd and all of, you know, all those wonderful bands in that era. Mm-hmm. So I started playing saxophone in, I think, second grade. And I was like, you know, the band geek most all the way up through high school. And I love Motown and soul and funk were just like really resonated with me at a really young age. I was always just listening to like much older music than I was. That explains a lot, by the way. 
in your stage <laughs> performance. Like I never put it together. Like there's there's definitely like a James Brown type of oh, just thank you so energy. Much. But thank you. Well, I was all, I've always like one of my new endeavors is going to be like I'm just thinking like think of a heavier raw James Brown <laughs> with a little rock twist. But yeah, that's that's the that's the next project is a, a just a soul soul project but real raw and uplifting but getting back to the whole the first question it, mm -hmm. it's so it started with saxophone i really wanted to sing but i was really shy about it so i just did a lot of singing privately on my own and when i by the time i graduated high school i thought singing was too self-absorbed i thought being a singer was selfish and because i you know had this dream where i need to go and save the world and um i wanted to join the peace corps and i was just very you know intrigued with what was going on in the rest of the world you know i was it was um second gulf war when i graduated high school mm -hmm. and i decided to go overseas to go volunteer on a kibbutz in israel Wow, and that you know was a change. You know, the course of my life. I, I think again, I ended up spending about five years traveling, volunteering, working under the table around Europe and you know other parts of the world. That's just awesome. That uh, you have all of these <laughs> seeds of like this well versed, well rounded person who's seen the north, seen the south, seen Europe. Um, seen places that are kind of very different than what most people are growing up with. Yes. And, and I'm, and I'm grateful for it, you know, moving every year, that was definitely tough, you know, being the new kid, always hoping to fit in or hoping that, you know, if you went back to the same school, that someone would remember you from a year and a half ago. Um, but I also think it really just opened my eyes to know that there's so much more going on, in, you know, just outside the little, the two worlds that I grew up in. And especially I was just very intrigued with the rest of the world and very intrigued with really how was it really playing out and our perception of it. I just had a feeling was different than, you know, what we were being portrayed in the news. You know, I wanted to go see it for myself. And, you know, I was originally supposed to be gone for eight months and I was gone a total of five years. And wow. It was hard to come back. You know, I got very addicted to, you know, moving to a new country and, you know, staying in a hostel till I found a job. And sometimes, you know, I'd find a place of my own or a place that I would find with another random traveler, you know, that I met. But I always got by by the skin of my teeth. I think it was there was many moments I remember like having a dollar or five dollars left to my name and I would find a job. <laughs> and you were doing this on your own. Yes. Yeah. Oh my yeah, goodness. Sure. This is, this is amazing. So you're, you're bouncing around for five years, just kind of doing the hostel, uh, backpacker kind of life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it started off in kibbutzes, you know, which is, you know, there's, they're, they're in Israel and they're basically like very well organized communes. Um, you are working for, you know, that, that community, your room and board is free. Um, you're working six days a week. I worked in the fields. I set up, you know, irrigation system for date fields, watermelon fields. I worked in the Omani where I made, you know, I prepped vegetables and cooked for, you know, hundreds of people at the same time. I did all kinds of different jobs. I, you know, really loved it. And then, you know, in that process, I met so many people from around the world that were like, you know, you as an American, you get a, a three month tourist visa most places that you go. And I was like, Oh, and I was just, I just turned 18. I was pretty green. And, and I was like, and my ticket home was through London. And I was like, well, maybe I can find a job in London. I've always wanted to go to Ireland. That's where my grandfather's from. You know, I was like, I'll just try and see what happens. And I almost didn't like when I got through, I was flying through Heathrow. I spent four hours in interrogation. Oh my. Um, they were like, you're just a runaway from America. And, and I, I mean, which sort of was true, but not, <laughs> you know, I'd lied and said, I've got lots of money. I'm going back for college. And, you know, <laughs> I was just like, had to lie through my teeth to basically get let into, you know, England. And, you know, they, they knew what I was trying to do, you know, in a sense, they're like, you're trying to work here illegally. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I ended up like I was like working um doing laboring in like Camden 
um, town like Chiseling Bricks. I mean, it was. Oh my just, goodness. Um, but I loved it. You know, I was just, I, I remember being really late my first day because I was trying to navigate the bus system and I had no idea where I was going. I went the wrong way and I was like two hours late my first day, but they, they didn't fire me the first day. <laughs> During this time, as you're doing all this, mm -hmm. are you just trying to figure things out? What are some of the ideas that pop in your head of like you, what you want to do with your life as you're going through this, as you're working fields and doing bricklaying? And <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I really was just trying to like, I knew that I needed to learn how to just take care of myself. But I, I you know, ironically, this, what's just weird in this sort of like full circle of things is, um, you know, my dad just sent me this video of myself. It's the same year that I went to Israel. It's my senior year. And I did this persuasive speech I did for drama. And I chose about being open-minded and about social justice and equality for all. And he just sent this to me this week. Wow. And it was me practicing this speech. And I haven't, I haven't seen or heard or read that speech since 1995. And it blew me away in a sense where I'm like, wow, where did that, you know, I'm still so much a part of that girl, but I think there was a lot of drive and passion that I lost along the way, you know, it's just, oh, I don't know if I'll make a difference or, you know, just kind of like you get into these frames of thinking, feeling sorry for yourself or my relationship with some of my family wasn't where I wanted it to. And that's why it was kind of easier for me to leave, you know, and, and yeah. be gone for a while. And I think two years into my trip, my dad actually came to visit me when I was, I had a stint in Greece. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad he did because I don't know if I would have ever come back. I think when I got out of, and kind of out on my own, I was like, this is it, I'm never going home. <laughs> but, you know, I also realized at the end of my five years, I was living in Australia at the time. My sister and my mother were pregnant and were giving birth that year. And I was in a, I was in a relationship with someone, but I knew that I just wasn't equipped emotionally to like, to move forward. Like I knew I was not a good person to be in a relationship with. And I realized that I'd kind of been running to for five years. As much as the soul searching was going on, if I want to be truly honest, I know that I was like, until I go home and I try to kind of understand my family and create some sort of you know, some sort of relationship mm -hmm. with some of them. Like, I think I'll always, you know, I'll never be good in any relationship. And so that's why I went, I came home. Wow. So you were in Australia in mm -hmm. right around 2000? Yeah, I came home right before, yeah, 2000. There's this link going on with Australia and me that's getting me really weirded out because uh, John Kenny, who is on this podcast, mm -hmm. he's, he's the owner of the Royal American, which is a place that you guys have played. Yes. He yes. was in Australia when you were there. And I went to Australia for oh. about six weeks at that time. I went on New Year's Eve going from 1998 to 99. Oh, cool. So I was there for six weeks for the Warp Tour. Oh, of course you were. And That's so, awesome. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> you were probably there, maybe. I don't know. Were you there? How long were you in Australia? for? I was there six or, six or eight months. Hmm. It was, yeah, it was kind of like the tail part, tail and part of uh, 99. Okay. So I probably wouldn't have been there at the same time. I just thought it's one of those things. I'm like, wait a second, you were in yeah. Australia and I'm doing the math. <laughs> and I'm like, I wonder if all three of us were in the same like country <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that happens. I, I do believe sometimes when you start talking to people that you're connected with, even with, you know, Brian, my husband, like we found we were in like the same exact place at the same exact show. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like years before we met, like, I, I think that, you know, you're connected to certain people and like, whether you meet them on that, that pass, you're probably going to, you know, hopefully meet them the next pass. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. That's, that's, a, that's <laughs> a very nice way to put it. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So you come home, you're getting with your family and through all this mm -hmm. time, you're not thinking I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's funny. I, I knew that I, I, I wanted to, um, to sing. And, and I, I started sitting in, there was like this cool, uh, when I lived in Greece, I, there was this Australian band that I met that I ended up kind of touring around Turkey with where I was just like sitting in playing like the djembe and like mm -hmm. bongos or whatever and, and trying to sing harmonies and terribly probably. And so like, it's always been this like deep desire, but I've, I used to like, 
I had this inner resistance and struggle where I was just like, no, that's you, that's just focusing all your energy on yourself. And like fast forward to now, and I think this is something that I'm really realizing is like, it's not a bad thing to focus your energy on yourself. But I think from just things I saw growing up and I just, I was just like, you know what? I've got all this love in my heart and love for people. And I feel like it needs to go out into the world. It needs to go out in any way that I, you know, can find a way to utilize. So to share that struggle with people, that's, I mean, that the yeah. connection, finding those connections with other people, that's why we do any kind of art form. Right. Yeah. And, and now I'm realizing like, actually, Angel, you know, you, you've, and in my, you know, with cusses, I learned with just how, you know, the engagement of it and, and, and talking with people like, oh, you can help people through music. You know, you can, you know, I can help people if I'm, you know, and it's like the word selfish. I was just like, you know, I don't want to be selfish, but you, you need to be selfish. You need to take the time to figure out what inspires you and, and what excites you and then put that into whatever form it may be and then, and then share it because that isn't, you know, that is a beautiful expression of life and love. And, you know, I'm finally figuring all this out. <laughs> so that's why I say I'm a late bloomer because it's something that the people very close to me knew wholeheartedly. It's what I've always wanted to do Yeah, is, is sing and, and be involved in music and some form of art fashion. And I, you know, came back from traveling. I moved to Philly with a girlfriend. I was like, okay, I don't think I can be in either city that my family is in, you know, Boston or Bristol. Uh, my dad was in Knoxville at this time. Mm -hmm. So I picked Philadelphia. I was a, a, a city I'd never, you know, a city I'd never lived in, has a really amazing, you know, art and music scene. And so I was in Philly for a little while and ended up going fishing with my grandmother in South Florida. <laughs> this is such a funny <laughs> story. I can't believe I'm telling you this. Um, and ended up getting introduced to one of my best, my, my, actually my flatmate in Philly. Um, she's like, you need to look up th my friend. You guys would get along so well. <laughs> and we got along really great so much that he, um, convinced me to hang out for a while. And this is in, this is Southwest Florida, Naples, Florida. Oh, wow. And, um, he, you know, we, we got along great. And I think I was at this point you know looking back where I Philly I was living in Philly my my roommate had been held up at gunpoint at my front doorstep and my friend best friend had gotten carjacked at my you know right outside my front door um and I was like hmm, maybe a chain of scenery might be you know healthy for me and you know I'm like <laughs> beautiful Gulf beaches. I'm like running down the beach. I'm like, this is beautiful. <laughs> the world is sending you a very loud and clear message. You know, so we started, we started dating and, um, he ended up getting, um, cancer. Oh, and that kind of changed my, my course. I ended up moving down there to help take care of him. And, um, and that, you know, that changed our, that made our relationship a lot more serious. And I think that just kind of, changed my whole perception of what I was supposed to be doing and where I was. And I was, I was still, I was young. I was like 23 years old. Um, I think at the time, 22, 23. That's heavy, dude. That's so heavy to deal with at that age. Yeah. And you know, and I think I was, you know, we, we ended up getting married. We ended up having a coffee shop to, uh, cafe. And, um, I think I was, you know, he was great. He's a great guy. And, and, um, I just was kind of confused about what love was, do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. what it was supposed to look like. And I was like, Oh, well, you've been traveling. This is what you're supposed to do. Like, okay. Now it's your, and so I was just feel like I was kind of convincing myself. This was the, the path I needed to take. And in, with that cafe, I uh, working pretty hard, you know, opening up a cafe five every morning. And, and, but I started doing, uh, live music at night and like made it into kind of an art sort of center, just like for my own sanity, but also to bring some sort of culture to this little area where I was having a hard time finding it. Mm -hmm. So I started doing live music, like just posting live music every night and um, letting an artist take over all the walls once a month. And it, you know, doing fundraisers for hurricanes, you know, whatever I could do to kind of like make it a little small community center kind of like helped, you know, just, yeah. helped my like fulfillment in that like part you know part of my life and in, in having that particular kind of work environment 
Wow. And that was like the first step of, you know, I ended up hiring um, this guy named Michael Succi, who was originally from Nashville, Tennessee and gone down there to retire. And I was letting him run the open mics. And he's like, you know, I was hearing you humming and singing. You've got a good voice. Why don't you get up there and sing with me? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not singing in front of all my customers. <laughs> um, and, you know, fast forward, I, you know, I ended up getting divorced and I ended up starting to, I needed to make some money. And so I started doing little side gigs with Mike and just, you know, singing a bunch of funk covers and soul covers and at little restaurants and bars. And that was kind of like my first sort of stint of actually performing in front of people. Yeah. Shortly after that, um, you know, I moved to New York to like put myself through some music school or, you know, something I hadn't had the opportunity to do before. And then Katrina happened. So I saw an opportunity where I could go and help. And I was like, you know, New York's going to be here, you know, for a while. Let me go down and just volunteer for a couple of months. Little did you know. <laughs> Little did know. I ended up staying there. I stayed in Mississippi uh, six months in Biloxi and six months in Louis, Holy cow. Louisiana. I'm, I'm going to start having to ask, so what state haven't you lived in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This um, is insane. You know, this kind is of great. another change of turn where I was just like, oh, I didn't know this, you know, but I, you know, my heart was breaking for everybody there. And so much of like what was going on in Biloxi wasn't covered in the news. And, you know, FEMA, like at the time, wasn't setting up tent cities in Biloxi and I kind of called a bunch of friends around America, a few, uh, five friends, you know, f like one of my best friends in Atlanta, two of my best friends in Atlanta, and then a couple of friends from Michigan. We all met in Gulfport, Mississippi, and they weren't letting anybody in because it was such a disaster zone. So we ended up, we, we helped Red Cross out for a day, but we were kind of really far removed. And I'm like, this isn't enough. Like, I really want to help more. And, you know, we had brought a bunch of tools and things that, you know, we could, you know, anything we could utilize. So we ended up. I'll say of borrowing a Red Cross magnet sticker from one of the vans <laughs> and put it on our, our pickup truck. And I just put an army hat on and just, you know, waved very nicely to the guys with the guns at the checkpoint and got in. Wow. And we just, we just set up this kind of renegade relief center um, and was just, it started going down every road and finding out what people needed and just, got to a point where I didn't know how to stop, you know, and I basically stayed there and stayed in that area until my, all my money ran out. And, um, and I started singing for tips with a friend in new Orleans. And that's kind of where that kind of, that kind of Holy held me a little bit more, cow. add a little bit to my, this might be my journey. This, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this might be the best okay how I got started in music story I have ever <laughs> heard. Holy uh, crap. So uh, you're now basically busking in New Orleans or I, are you on I, the street? Yeah, you're I mean, in places? I found, somebody, I found somebody that was willing to take a chance to let me sing it, sit in with his band, uh, West Bank, West Bank Mike is what they called him. Wow. And um, just sit in and let me sing a few of the blues tunes. I'm, you know, Terribly, I'm sure a lot of it. I was so nervous that I start. I would just I'd have to drink a lot of Crown Royal before I got on stage, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I don't think I don't think it improved my abilities. But I was also just still figuring my voice out, you know. Yeah. But I I knew I loved it. I knew I had some sort of like volume behind it, and um, but it really wasn't until cusses till I knew, you know, until I was really pushed and I knew my my you know kind of what where that where it could go. Yeah, what you, what you were capable of, which is basically right. making every record recording engineer go, "Okay, we got to pull out the dynamic microphones cuz uh, <laughs> this is not going to work with a standard old condenser <laughs> mic." Um <laughs> Yeah, that's that's in that's so amazing. I'm like I'm completely floored about A that you <laughs> you've lived this dual life as a kid. And then mm -hmm. just continue to bounce around and, and uh, you've, you haven't really found a place, a single place to call home. Yeah. I mean, that's a good, that's a good observation. I think, um, and I think that's, it's something, you know, I don't know if I ever will find one place that I think is forever, you know, um, because 
you know, it, it's harder as you get older, for sure, moving yeah. and trying to start a whole new community. Moving to Nashville was definitely, it's a little tougher starting over. And Brian and I both didn't realize that, like, he would have to have arm surgery and arms, you know, kind of shoulder surgery. And I would have surgery and, you know, we'd have to put things on hold. And um, you, you've and moved we to Music just, City and you're both being basically held. You're being interrupted <laughs> yes. as to yeah. doing the thing you guys are seemingly born to do. Do you think that the the lifestyle of growing up with the with, from a broken family kind of prepared you or kind of set you up to live a life as a kind of nomad, you know, kind of bouncing yes. around wherever you lay your head yeah. is home type of situation? Yeah, I think it definitely prepared me for touring. <laughs> I was like, I love this. I love touring. You know, touring's tough, but Oh, yeah. yeah, being in a different city every day. I mean, I love that for a long time. You know, not all cities and shows are the same. You know, some are pretty tough. Sometimes you're playing to five people, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. And you get um, paid in, sh- in pocket change and you're like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. I remember us traveling from from Savannah, Georgia to Nashville and I made the mistake of, not, you know, not negotiating. Uh a guarantee and just taking the word from the promoter that it was going to be a big show, whatever. And I remember the guy paying me, he's like, Oh, that should get you enough crystal. And I thought he was kidding. And I looked to see what I got paid because the, you know, the production fee, we played this, you know, great venue and that's what the product production fee was insane. Oh. And, um, I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, that hurt a little. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back. So, you know, Savannah, Georgia was, was the longest place I've ever lived consecutively in my whole entire life. There's something about that area. Like I'm in Charleston for, a, I didn't realize I would be here as long as I've been here. And yeah. you kind of get sucked in here. There's some, there's a, there's a beauty here and it's almost like it kind of hypnotizes you. <laughs> I don't know what's, yeah. what it is. It, it's beautiful. You don't feel it. You know, you kind of forget you, you are, you know, even like, I felt like I, I forgot I was in Georgia. Um, but the community, like that's, I mean, Brian and I were living in LA at the time and, you know, we, I had lost a family member and his dad was sick at the time mm-hmm. in Charleston. He's like, you know, Savannah's, he'd gone to college there. He's like, Savannah's a great community. It's like, you know, why don't we move back East coast for a little while, be closer to our families. And, you know, Savannah's a great place to to create whatever you want and a, and a, you know, more affordable atmosphere. So when I first moved there, it was like middle of summer. Like that, I was like, I just was imagining tumbleweeds going down the street. I was like, <laughs> what have I done? But, you know, then, you know, shortly after I met some of the best people I've ever met, the community was extremely just encouraging and supportive. It reminded me a lot of the new Orleans feel like people were there to create, not to kind of be competitive or push someone aside for their success. They were really doing it for the love and, and the, the art of it. So, you know, in Savannah, it, it was just, it, it was great for me. It, it really helped me kind of come into my own, you know, especially with working with Brian and Brian, they pushed me a lot. I mean, I, Brian and my husband and I, Brian, hmm. <laughs> um, we were together for years before he even heard me sing. Wow. I was too, I was too shy to even sing for him, which a lot of people still don't believe. They're just assumed like we met through music and we started doing music. I was like, actually, no, we didn't start music. We didn't start doing music together till years after we met. And I love the idea that you were too shy to sing in front of him because it's yeah, just such a juxtaposition to the person who I know you as. Right. Right. And yeah, most people don't believe that, you know, the, the people that have known me pre cusses or you know saw me shaking at like karaoke you know or <laughs> <laughs> hiding behind somebody you know i used to be at the back of the stage trying to sit next to the drummer or stand next to the drummer i was like being in the front of the stage just petrified me and i i literally was just shaking and and i still get nervous you know it's it's been that's a good thing. it's been a year now since my show but i still get very nervous but i think it's just you know it's a very vulnerable place and you're sharing your heart and soul up there. Yeah, I think if you don't get nervous, then the, I mean, there are some people who just don't. But yeah, there, there's a certain amount of of anything can happen. So no matter how mm-hmm. prepared you are, you don't know some but something yeah. crazy can. Someone might pull a gun out in the middle of a set and point it at you while you're trying to sing, and you're like, "Why yeah. is this happening to me?" Yeah, 
Yeah. But, you know, you never yeah. know. There's, th- I mean, that's an extreme example. But yeah. for the most part, yeah. you're just worried about not letting these people down. Yeah. You know, it, and it's and it's crazy because, like, I, I've learned so much and even just taking breaks from cusses um, and doing a lot of like I've done a lot of kind of self-work and awareness it be in this past year the most I ever have in my entire life. And, and it just like these fears that I've had and, and it's just, I know they're just so silly in the grand scheme of things, but it's, it's, it's amazing how these little fears you have in your mind are, can be so paralyzing. Yeah. So you, you guys, you, you are in Savannah. In Savannah, Brian reconnects with Brian Harder, his college buddy who stayed in Savannah, became an architect, had two two boys, and they're like, you know, let's get the band back together. And and they um they started playing again and the um but they didn't have a singer. I think they invited the there's one of their singers they'd worked with a long time ago, but just don't think he was in the same place as them. So Brian had asked me to to sit in with them, but I, I told him no for like six months because I was <laughs> like, there's no way we should be in a band together. I was like, it's going to ruin everything. <laughs> and I was like, this is your guide time. This is my time to be alone. I was like, <laughs> so I kind of fought it for quite a while. And, and so in that meantime, they're just building all this music. So I finally like sat in with them once and I had like ideas for everything that they had written. And I was like, oh man. I was like, wow. oh, I was like, well, I guess we need to do something. And so it just it just started out of fun. And, and um, we had our first show at the Jinx in Savannah, Georgia. And, oh, yeah. You know, the town came out to support us. And and it was from then on, it was just it just took it took a life of its own. And, and, it, and it helped me tremendously kind of process all these things I think I've been running from. And, you know, I, I wrote a lot about it. Uh, you know, a lot of kind of my feelings and past experiences in my, in the first album, I made it, you know, and I made it vague enough. So you didn't really know what I was talking about, but when I was on stage and I was singing those words, I I really, I I knew exactly. It was the, it was such a cathartic. You were tapping in experience. I was tapping in. And I think that's what I, I, when, now when I talk to people are like, man, you just seem so like, angry or you know emotional or you know full of all this angst or whatever and I'm like well I think it's just the first time that I was able to really get out and my throat chokes up about this and this is something that I'm learning and I learned this with my therapist this past year is that the moment I want to start speaking my truth Mm -hmm. and the moment I start talking about something that's very difficult for me my throat closes up on me And it's, and it's ironic that now I'm dealing with this health thing, you know, that is, 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 you know, kind of making that happen even more so. Yeah. So, uh, I just, it's something I'm, I'm very aware of. And and even just talking to you, I was like, okay, I hope my voice doesn't clam up. (laughs) Um, but I I think it's a, it's a good thing too. It's very telling. It's taught me a lot, you know, in this past year about what I've been scared to say and, and just, you know, talk about or be honest and, and not be scared, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's such a strange time right now for a lot of creators, artists of different genres, because trying to, to work through this situation we all find ourselves in. And then when you have some real things that you're trying to deal with on top of that, you don't want to feel like you're um, being self-centered when everyone else is suffering. Yes. But here you are. You've been dealing with something that you had been hiding. I shouldn't say hiding, but it just it wasn't something you wore on your sleeve. You you seem through you telling your your story so far, you seem to be somebody who was seeking out people to help. Mm-hmm. Like you're you're running to these places, not running, but you're going to these mm-hmm. places. And you're trying to help people, trying to establish it. You went to Mississippi to help after Katrina. You went to Florida to help with this gentleman uh, who you mm-hmm. liked who mm-hmm. got cancer. You're doing. You're, you're living this selfless life, mm-hmm. and now it's coming. Now it's time to to worry about Angel. Yeah. And it comes at <laughs> and it comes at the worst possible time because it's when everybody is worried about everything. Mm-hmm. But you shouldn't feel like 
you know, I, I, you know that you shouldn't feel any other way than, than, than to deal with what you need to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and ironically, I'm, I'm, I, in this weird sense, I've been like, well, this is just like the time. This is the time that I, it was supposed to come to a head for me. I mean, honestly, I've been feeling bad for a long time and it's been hard to find the right doctors that are willing to dig in. And, right. you know, a year ago I went and had an ultrasound of my thyroid oh. and, you know, they didn't, they didn't see anything. And, but, you know, finding a, a general practitioner that wants to like, has a holistic, you know, that's w- willing to like kind of dig deeper and not just give you a bunch of pharmaceutical, you know, right. drugs to, just to kind of put a band aid on things, you know? Um, I think it has also taught me that I just didn't have that self love for myself. My self worth and self love has always been like the last thing I've ever thought of. And, and for some reason, like I've held onto a guilt that I wasn't supposed to, to focus on myself. And so I knew I needed to, and it, re- it took up until about a, until a year ago that I found a therapist um, that really kind of pushed me, you know, just a little more just, pushing in a way really helped me ask some like difficult questions and, and also helped me like really encourage me to take alcohol out, you know, of my kind of, you know, in the, in the industry that we're in, it's always around you. I was yeah. used to always, you know, just you're, I was just casually drinking three or four times a week. And last year I was like, okay, I'm still having all these issues, you know, um, with my stomach and, you know, other parts of my body. And, well, maybe alcohol, maybe that's the last piece I need to take out because I had changed my diet drastically. I, you know, I was doing all these things the last couple of years and I didn't, I think I realized now how important taking alcohol out was just for my, my mental health and my mental awareness of, of these habits that I've been doing and just, yeah. you know, distracting myself. Like, like, yes, I've been helping people and in, in living a life of selflessness, but I think it was, it also contributed it it's also because I just didn't think I was worthy of that attention. Well, I mean, yeah, just to go back on the alcohol thing real quick, because mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. you're worthy of the attention. So pause there mm-hmm. for a second. But I had a big <laughs> smile the whole time you're talking about that because it's something I'm just dealing with myself. I'm sitting here talking to you, drinking a non-alcoholic black ale, hairless dog. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just, it's something I've kind of like, just like, all right, let me, let me, uh, see how it feels. Well, yeah, during this time, I was just, I was, yeah. I was starting to notice the side effects of just casually yeah. drinking. I didn't think I had a problem. Right. But, you know, three, three, four times a week of having, not even getting drunk, just having a few drinks. Right. And the depression it would cause, the sleep mm-hmm. issues. Just like it's not worth it. Yeah, and you, you're just so used to it, you just don't realize it until you take it out. Right, and when you, you and, know, and you, I can speak better now, I can think better now. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> Those are great things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yeah. So you are worth it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and you're worth it to a lot of a lot of people. Probably already know that, but it was it was kind of shocking when you shared recently that you have been dealing with uh an autoimmune issues Mm -hmm. and um and it's kind of snowballed yeah so i i don't know how i don't know how detailed you want to get into it on this podcast you You can you know i mean we can i think i think what i'm learning is I, I, I need to like, ex- you know, share as much as I can without going into like gross details. <laughs> um, because I, I, I'm realizing just by sharing that first post that I was just petrified of even sharing, um, the response of just people privately messaging me and, and, and it's correlating because the thing with autoimmune is I usually, when you get one, you're more susceptible to another. And so, and that makes sense to me. Um, I think it's our, you know, my sister who went back and forth with me every other year, you know, two sisters from my, my youngest sister would go back and forth with me and she, um, was diagnosed with MS in college. Oh my. And I just thought it's been very telling. I was like, you know, and I kind of actually talked to her a little bit about it today. I was like, I think it, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, we, we had a lot of stress growing up and we were just constantly trying to adapt and our, and our bodies were kind of in this fight or flight mode all the time. And so it doesn't surprise me that yours turned into MS and now mine is three different autoimmune diseases affecting, you know, 
I was already originally, you know, to be very telling is this month I had an operation set up already for my endometriosis because I'm at, I'm at a point now where, you know, I want to have a child, um, but I've been having such issues and such pain mm. that that is, you know, and it hasn't allowed me to do it. So that was something I was working on, you know, I'd gone to and I found about it, this new GP that was just, you know, supposed to be on kind of more my, a lot that I was aligned with. And I went to her was like, okay, I've got endometriosis, celiac and, and this Hashimoto's. Oh, I just need some help. Like, how do we navigate this? And, you know, she luckily was the one that did and dove in and did some like really thorough blood work. And that's when, um, it showed up like how my thyroid uh, blood, blood work was really, really off. Um, I was supposed to be somewhere in between a four and 11 on, on one of the things that was 942. And she's like, all right, this is cause for, you know, concern. Let's get an ultrasound. And then, so that was, you know, pre, you know, I wanted to go to her pre COVID, but then COVID happened. And then I was like, Oh, I have three autoimmune diseases and this and every, and right. everything you hear about COVID it's your immune compromise, you know, lock yourself in the closet. You know, it's just like, I did lock myself in the closet, but I definitely was, you know, very mindful about just like keeping myself away from a lot of things and people. Um, yeah. So I didn't get to this doctor till June. July is when they the ultrasound showed up something suspicious, and then in August I had the biopsy, and that's when they found this a hurtful cell tumor. It's sticking out of my neck, um, but my thyroid has been swollen on and off, and it's been messing with my vocal cords for a couple of years now. And I've just tried to push through it, you know. And I've taken everything out of my diet, you know. With having celiac, it's it's a, you know all connected to your stomach, which I think is another place where we store, you know, stress and secrets and, mm -hmm. you know, just not being able to eat without having a reaction, you know, was, has been kind of my life for the last few years. And I've been trying all the things, doing all the research and, and, and any kind of natural, uh, you know, holistic approach I could do it with taking small medications, like for the thyroid to kind of, you know, help regulate certain things. I think that's kind of where I'm just like, I really am like, okay, Angel, this is the time to wake up. Right. <laughs> you, you, you know, Herthel cell, um, is a, I, in this weird, it, it's the only, only thyroid cancer that can spread. It's most thyroid cancers stay within the thyroid. That's why people say if you get thyroid cancer, it's the best one to get. <laughs> but, um, Herthel cell is, um, it's more on the rare side. It's, the only one that can spread to, you know, lymph nodes, your bones, and, and, and I think your liver. But it's also the one that you can't tell if it's cancer through the biopsy. Right. So that was interesting to find out. But um, in this weird, weird sense, I've been feeling, well, I've done all this work <laughs> this last year, mentally, spiritually, physically, and... And even during this quarantine, like having almost, you know, it's been almost six months, but those first three, three months where I couldn't run and go try to save somebody, even though I did try to go, I wanted to go beat my grandmother who was living in, you know, an assisted living in Boston and she got COVID, her, her whole wow. building got COVID. And I was trying to find a way to get a job in the building so she wouldn't be alone. Oh my goodness. And you're, <laughs> here you are. Yeah. No. <laughs> I know my, all my family was like, no. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I was just like, I was close to it. I mean, I was looking up, I was I submitting my job application. And, and then, I, then I really thought about like, you know, I talked to my grandmother, she's like, Angel, I love you, but like, I don't want you to put yourself in danger to be here. And so I only had myself to look at and focus on. And that, this, this was the first time that I really, really had all the time in the world, where I couldn't distract myself with work, couldn't distract myself with touring, couldn't distract myself with family. It was just me. And I did a lot of great work in, in that time. Like, you know, of course it's been scary. Um, I've had my moments, but it just, it, and being sober too, like it, may, it even made me more aware of like, oh, wow, I've been numbing myself for so long. Um, I've just been so unaware of, of these 
ne- negative habits that I tell myself, you know, or, you know, I, I kind of act out on the daily or the negative thoughts that I tell myself. And so I feel, I feel so different than like, I feel like completely different person in a way than I did a year ago and, and even more in so much growth in the last six months. So I feel kind of like grateful that, I mean, if this is what needed to happen, you know, or there, there may, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's just a, I, I, and this is, I just, try, I'm trying to make light of it. I keep saying, it's just a tiny tumor. <laughs> and yeah. I'm going to go in and they're going to find, you know, it's just going to be a tiny tumor. They're going to take it out. And, you know, there's, there's some, you know, other good news about it too, is that I was referred to an oncology surgeon here. Um, but I, I, um, and I was told he would be, he would be taken out. He wants to take out my whole thyroid, which that's not something I've wanted to do. And I've had trepidation about getting a thyroid surgery because it's sitting on your vocal cords and right. you're just hoping that the surgeon knows what they're doing and, you know, that I can sing again. Um, even though I knew that the swollen thyroid was affecting my singing, you know, especially, you know, I think our last show was over a year ago and I struggled to get through it. Um, and I noticed, you know, just my range and stuff and especially the last year in the last six months is just, is shot. I, I I have like a quarter left of what my voice was. So, but the good news is I, I was like, okay, I can't waiting three weeks after finding out you have this and that it's, it's the only, you know, they don't know if it's cancer and they don't know if it's spread. And, and I also don't know how long I've had it. And, but I know I've been feeling that for a long time. And so I'm like, okay, I think time is of essence. Like, let me do a little more research on who else is out there. And I talked to a neighbor that I remember saying that she'd had, she'd had thyroid surgery and cancer last year. And I was like, didn't you say you had a good experience? She's like, yeah, actually I was supposed to go to someone in Vanderbilt at Vanderbilt and she had a bad experience. So she did research and found this guy named Dr. Clayman who is in um, Tampa, Florida. And she said it was the best experience that I can really describe to you. And he was such an empathetic person, like go online and just submit your case to him. Wow. And so I went online and I, um, you know, very thorough, very thorough kind of submission. And, um, I was like, well, maybe in about a week or so, you know, the office will get back to me. And and meanwhile, I, you know, but I was like, after reading, you know, you should just look up this guy, but after reading information about him and, and how people from all over the world come to see him and that he moved from, he moved from Texas to Tampa to create this whole just thyroid disease and cancer center and how he'd done over 8,000, you know, surgeries. I was like, okay, I'm just going to jump and jump, try to put all my, all my eggs in his basket. And, um, in less than 48 hours, he called me. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and you don't know whether to think like you're blessed or scared because wait a second, yeah, what is this guy like, reading going, man? I gotta so, call you. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I, mean, I realized that like, you know, he like texted me, can you FaceTime? And I was like, what? I just, I've dropped the phone and, um, he FaceTimed me that <sighs> evening, like, and, he just, you know, here, let me hear your story. And he's like, and then this is, you know, I've, I've read all your information and I've got, um, I've, you know, gotten your latest test results and, you know, you know, whether you work with me or not, I just want to inform you about, you know, what I think is going on, but I just want you to make sure that you find the right surgeon that knows what they're doing. He's like, a lot of oncology surgeons are just going to want to take out your whole thyroid. A lot of oncology surgeons haven't, necessarily work with her cell, you know, um, like tumors. And he's just like, make sure this is someone that's doing one a year or one a month. Cause that's usually what a lot of oncology surgeons are doing. He's, you know, make sure that these, this, whatever surgeon is doing like 10 to 20 a week. And I'm like, okay. And he, I learned, I mean, we sat there and talked for an hour and I was like, do you call all your patients? And he's like, no, I don't. Um, and I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, I'm calling because this is, you know, you don't know how long this has been. This isn't something you want to mess around with. And it's more, I think of a pressing, it's a more of a time sensitive um, situation. I was like, well, you know, I, I, you know, I've read up all about you and you know, I, I, I think I just want to come down to you. And he's like, okay, we'll just, you know, he said, I would be honored to take care of you. And, um, 
I was just so grateful. I was like, it's going to make me emotional talking about it. But I was just so grateful that he took the time to you know read my case and call me and let me know like kind of the urgency of it and he's like you know scheduling will be in touch with you and um I've always wanted everyone to make sure that they you know when I opened this center I wanted to make everyone feel like family and I was like well that's totally in line with how I feel I I hope to treat everyone like family I believe we're all connected and he said that's exactly how I live my life and he was like the zen wow. like the zen doctor like I was just like who who are you yeah seriously and, uh, what country is this now uh, <laughs> is this in America oh, I know <laughs> right so that that's given me so much like kind of peace moving forward like you know that just and I am um you know, I, I'm just kind of moved. And I think that like, no matter what he finds that he, I'm in the best hands you right. know, possible. Like he, he wants to, you know, he taught me a lot about Hashimoto's. He also told me, which really excited me. He's like, you know, what we found in the last few years is that people with Hashimoto's, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, it's, attacking itself and now parts of your thyroid has died off and it's diseased and then that area is slowly eating away at the rest of your thyroid and so he's like we found by taking with people with Hashimoto's by removing the diseased part of the, the thyroid and saving the healthy tissue that 80 percent of their symptoms are gone in weeks after their surgery and I was like well I was like, you're selling me. You're not like doing a good <laughs> job selling me. I was, I was like, I never knew that. I mean, I have, I have every thyroid book in, you know, the world done so much reading on it. And um, he's like, you know, I feel bad. We, we only discovered this three years ago. It was a study in Sweden and I've been practicing it now for three years. And he's like, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know? So, um, so I'm going to Tampa, Florida next week to have this surgery. Wow. That's, that is unbelievable. And the yeah. and i can i i completely understand your urgency in feeling like it's time for you to share this with people mm-hmm. because yeah. now it's become apparent like it, you don't want to wait you don't want to something's wrong yeah. you should probably look into it especially when you get so in tune with your body that yeah. you 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 know something's up like we can, we yeah. all lie to ourselves about little yeah. things, you know, we all go like, I've got this little niggle going on and I'm, you know, if I don't touch it, it, it doesn't hurt <laughs> that kind of thing or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Time is of the essence. Uh, I got a question for you. Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Robin Roberts? She's uh, Robin Roberts. she's one of the hosts on the that. today show. She's a journalist. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, I love Robin Roberts. Sorry. Okay. I was like, Why do I know that name? I had no She's idea awesome. who she was at, until I was looking at, um, I was looking on Masterclass, which is that thing, that yes, subscription service. Yes. So she has a class on there. And and when I first started this podcast, uh, she has one. It's, it's supposed to be about communications. And I was like, great, because right. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched it and I yeah. got completely, she like completely, her story is amazing. She, her life story is you. I feel like when I'm listening to you, I'm like, you need to connect with Robin Roberts. But wow. one of the messages that she has shared or her mantra and motto in life is make your mess, your message. Mm. Oh, that's so good. And I feel like that is something that you are, dealing with right now. You've got this, for lack of a more uh, Mm -hmm. sympathetic term, you've got a mess on your hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's now going to be your message. Now it's, it's your whole life has been you living for other people. And now you've been forced to live for yourself. Mm -hmm. And through that, you can still help other people. So you're kind of hacking yeah. a little, you're hacking the game here. You're, you're like, I can still take care of myself and, and be aware and, 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 uh, pay attention to myself and put yeah. myself first, but still help yes. other people. Yes. And, and I, that's the big lesson I'm learning. You know, it's, it's, it's huge lessons I'm learning and, and just by people responding and reaching out, you know, there's, we're all in this boat together and and we we all are having, we all have these inner struggles. It's just, we don't talk about it, you know, as much, you know, and, 
when you start taking elements out of your body or things that you do to numb yourself, it's even more telling in, you know, in your self-awareness. And I think that's what this whole year has taught me. Yeah. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm realizing so many things that, you know, I think that 18 year old girl really knew, um, and, and set off to go find, but in the midst of that, you know, you, you know, you can still get lost and you can start, you know, that's when I started drinking alcohol, you know, right. as well as, you know, it's just, and now, you know, <laughs> Brian and I, we talk about all the time, like, man, I lost a lot of years just drinking through them. <laughs> um, I mean, I had a lot of experiences too, but man, I was just, you know, not, not to like talk about regret, but there's this, I'm just realizing a lot of those things that I, you know, I could have maybe been a little ahead of the game, but Who's to say this all, you know, it's all needed to manifest in the way that it did. And, you know, maybe this is just, you know, my, me learning about myself and is going to help other people hopefully learn about themselves and, and put themselves first. Yeah, that's, that's my biggest hope. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some, some theoretical questions because we don't okay. know what the future is. We don't even know if, no. if the world is going to exist in five minutes from now. Um, hopefully it does, but so yes. I can get through this. Um, yes. let's imagine that we make it through the world makes it through this pandemic. Um, we come out on the other yes. end of this stronger, uh, connected more, more together. Mm-hmm. You, um, are successful in treating your, your tumor and your yes. other autoimmune diseases as well, getting yes. those in, in, in check, so to speak. Yes. How does this experience affect your songwriting? Like you had mentioned before that previously your songs were kind of, no one would know what you were talking about except for you. Mm-hmm. Does that change? Do you, do you open it up now and, and, and kind of start pouring yourself out onto the page? And Yes. Yes, for sure. I, and I actually started doing that pre, pre, pre learning of the tumor. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I was able to, um, cause I've had this extra time. So, you know, I was able to learn how to do, uh, you know, Ableton live where I'm just kind of learning how to record myself and build songs and record samples or take samples and, and build things, build things that way, which was, you know, I didn't, you know, going back to self doubt, I didn't think I was capable of that. And, you know, I'm still very, you know, in the baby stages of it, but it's been, that's opened up a whole new world of writing for me. And I've been writing all these like ballads, like totally very, very so far from what Cussus was. So, um, that's been really freeing and exciting. Um, and I definitely, you know, ironically, the, the one song that really sticks out in my head is, um, it, I, I talk about like, you won't feel nothing at all. And I know that's just me talking to myself, just mm-hmm. like not, not loving myself and, and not allowing myself to feel anything. And that, I think I, you know, I wrote that in April. Um, so I, yeah, I, I definitely, I see a whole, you know, not being so kind of timid um, in my writing and, and, and let, and just kind of let it all hang out a lot more. Instead of being a super strong performer, you're going to be a super strong <laughs> writer and not that you weren't and, uh, i'm not i'm not taking away from yeah, your writing no, i'm no, just know, yeah i'm just saying that all that energy you put into what w- what was in you and you were letting mm-hmm. it out on stage mm-hmm. you can turn it around and and have all of that kind of rage and and uh emotion and love and anger all balled up but it can be in a verse yes that's exciting and you live in the perfect perfect place to explore that. Uh, I, I had somebody on this podcast who, who's from as a Nashville singer songwriter and hearing him talk about the community of songwriters there and the musicianship and, and just the whole thing that exists there. You, you kind of, yes. you're in the right place to go down that, I am. that and, road. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm still ready. Like I still got to tap into it. You know, I, I was, gone kind of the first year on my own, like touring and, 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 you know, then I had surgeries and then, um, tornado happened in COVID. So I, I've, I'm, Oh my gosh, the tornado. It's given a lot of, yeah. This I mean, year has been like 40 years long. Ripped, <laughs> ripped our, ripped our neighborhood apart, but it's given, given 
you know, myself and Brian, but like, it's just given us a lot of time for like perspective within our own worlds and given yeah. us time just to really hone in and, and, and kind of work on ourselves. And um, so I'm looking forward to when the town opens back up and I can start writing with different people and just, you know, see where any of that goes. It's um, yeah. I think, Who knows? I, I think that um, the world needs to prepare itself for what you <laughs> unleash on it because there's so, so much, you have so much to offer in so many different ways. And uh, yeah, that I, you get the feeling that before you were just, you, you guys as a unit, as cusses, were just scratching the surface. I think yeah. anyone who understood what they were witnessing to us, any, not even fully understood it, just understood a little bit of what they were witnessing. It became instant fans, even if they're not oh. into like hard rock or That's heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that a lot actually. I'm not into the style of music, but I really like what y'all are doing. <laughs> I took my brother-in-law who only listens to to um to West Coast hip hop. He's very specific nice. about what he listens to. I was like, you gotta nice. come see this band. He's like, whatever. I was like, <laughs> just I'm telling you, you're not gonna you're not gonna understand until you watch this band. I can't explain it to oh. you. And he was totally like he was he was in. He was like, oh my gosh, yeah. that was amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank so, you so much. Uh, uh, that's, of course, one small example of what <laughs> Cusses has meant to me as a band. Oh, thank um, you. And, and just, oh my goodness. I had no idea the uh, weight that came along with uh, that music was this life that you've led, this journey you've been on, this, this quest to make the world a better mm -hmm. place. Very noble. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's been, um, it's been the best therapy for me too. You know, I, I always felt kind of relieved and exhausted, um, at the end of every show. Cause I just, I was able to get all that out, you know, and in an yeah. hour and I made sure I got every bit of it out oh, yeah. you know, that I could. And I missed that. I missed that. <laughs> Can I ask you another cusses related question? Yeah, now knowing all this stuff, did the makeup that you wore, a lot of times you, you, you would kind of wear yeah. extreme makeup on your face. Mm -hmm. Was that, uh, was that purposeful in, in a, in an emotional thing or was that just something you did? Cause it looked cool. Um, I think it kind of helped me go to like that other place. It was like putting my war paint on. Almost, yeah. You know what I mean? Like just kind of. All right, you know, just and I watched my dad. My dad used to dress up and paint his face and stuff too, and I love that. You know, that's but amazing. I think like you know, sometimes I do a full mask, but just like having that, like my little black check that I did under my eye, it was like okay, I'm this other person. I, you know, I can go to this other place that I'm always so shy about, and I'm just you know, and being completely frazzled with nerves up until the first beat of whatever, you know, the extreme of the guitar or the drums. And then I would just kind of black out and just let it, let it all out. Yeah. That's, that's uh that it was just one of those things that, you know, in context of, of our conversation, I'm like, yeah, I wonder what that, I wonder if that meant something else or, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. So, um, looking forward I know we were just mm -hmm. talking about songwriting and and yeah. and dealing with your and taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you want to do a funk, not funk, a soul kind of project. That's that's an idea that's that's going. Yeah, that's definitely. I've got a good friend in New York, uh, Ray Anger. He's a great um, pianist producer, and so I've been working on a, a couple songs with him. Mm -hmm. um, I have kind of you know some a lot of ideas i mean it's kind of like i want to mix a lot of different stuff genres and it's kind of like we did with cusses try to cu cultivate my own sound it's very hard to do that these days but you know a huge soul and motown element i think the heart behind that era just always moved me stevie wonder is my all-time favorite musician um wow. you know i just um i've always been moved by that and so i i, I see myself doing like a 
felt almost like a cuss's version of, <laughs> of like of like you know James Brown, you know, like just James Brown, Sue Wonder, all that. Just the same high energy. We'll throw some ballads in there, but full horns, you know, all the all the bells and whistles of, of that kind of sound. And and we are doing. Um, we 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 have talked, and we will move forward. You know, after I'm all healed up, we want to put out our like at least our last maybe. Um, um, our third album for Cusses, we have so many songs we haven't recorded and there was a lot that we were touring with that, you know, I think are some of all three of ours, our favorite songs we've ever written. So we're going to make sure that we follow through with that in the next year and um, get down to Savannah and fine tune them and, you know, at least record, you know. Is Architect Brian going to be playing guitar on this? Yeah, I hope so. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's he's our he's the OG guy and the guy we wrote with. So, you know, we hope that he can do that. And if he can't, we also have another good friend of ours who stepped in and, and toured with us, you know. Yeah, that was amazing, back. by the way. When that guy came in, I was like, Chris, yeah. Yeah, Chris I was like, uh, how's it? Come on now. Does he have an extra yeah. arm? Is he going to be able to do this like Brian can? Right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it sounded great. He, he learned. He learned. We had we had an opportunity to open up for the Descendants and 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 Harder couldn't make the trip and so my best friend you know was dating Chris Cook who has actually worked in a music store with my sister twenty years ago it was just this weird circle of events and he learned a set of cusses in probably two weeks wow and and, and mm-hmm. then and then slayed it you know and um. You know he he he's he's such a great human being too. So um, that's amazing. It, it was it was it was nice to be able to kind of play play a few more shows out there with him. So did he was he on any of the recordings? Like I know you you guys released a single earlier this year. No, no. Harder's the only Harder's still the only one that we've used for recordings. Or, you know. I was just curious. That so, was that was one of my yeah. questions just for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Well. Is there anything else you wanted to say about what you have gone through? You know, I think just really kind of what I've been trying to, you know, is just like, listen to your bodies, listen to your heart, listen to, you know, listen to, to the things you've been ignoring for so long, you know, maybe listen to the things that you've, you've kind of hidden and just pay attention to them and and just pay attention to what triggers you and, um, and don't be afraid to like give yourself the time and energy that you need and, and, and be kind to yourself. I think I've always been so harsh and hard on myself and you don't realize how just saying those words to yourself quietly, how they affect you and your, your, you know, your kind of mental state and your self-awareness and the self-love. Um, I think we all struggle with it. We're in a society where we're just kind of go, 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 go. And I've got to be better than this, or I need a better car or more money. And, you know, I'm not moved by material things and I'm, I'm really moved by like connection and, and love. And, and I'm realizing now that like, you know, you might not have any of that if you don't focus this energy on yourself. So it's been a good wake up call for me, um, a forced wake up call, but I think, you know, I've known this for so long and you, you know, we have so much inner resistance, you know, we try, we try things, but we almost, maybe we just try half, half fast because we're, you know, f- afraid of failure, or, you know, all, all kinds of reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm probably repeating myself. I think it's just, no, no, this is great. Listen to yourself and, 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 you know, love yourself. The best. It's, it's, a, it's, it's tough to do, but it's, it's really important. And I, and I'm, I'm just scratching the surface on how to do it. I don't know how to do it, but, I think it's just being gentle with yourself. If, if you, you know, just being gentle with yourself is really important. That's the one thing I'm learning and having, not letting your expectations of others, you know, not letting that bring you down. I think it's so easy for us to fall into this victim frame of mind. Um, why, you know, why did this happen? Or, you know, and then you, you make that narrative a part of your story. And then next thing you know, it's stored in your, in your body. Some people are capable of what you want them to be. Um, and, and you have to let that go and not take it personally. And I think that's like my biggest lessons is just not taking things personally, really trying to understand where people come from and just, and see them come from a place of love and, and see them in a light of love. 
and I and, and then hopefully you can work through your own and learn how to love yourself. That's beautiful. I love it. I love it so much. It's such a it's such an important message that so many people unfortunately take uh it takes life to really open that door for you, for you. And uh if somebody is listening to this and hears hears it, you know, if you're the type of person who's outwardly helping other people to the to the detriment of your own health, you can't mm-hmm. help other people without helping yourself first. You you, you can't. Yeah. There's a reason why that oxygen mask, uh, when it drops out of the the airplane, <laughs> yeah, uh, where, yes. where it, it has so the instructions true. to put it on your own face first. Yes, it's not to be selfish. It's because you can't help the person next to you unless you're taken care yes. of. Yes. All right. So I have one last question. Okay. And I, I really, 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 really am so grateful that you came on and talk, talked about um, what you're going through and, and you're just an amazing person. And I am just floored by like your whole life story at this point. So what I'd lo- the last question is during this period of your life, this, this kind of struggle that you've been going through, has there any, been a piece of art that has helped carry you through, whether it be a song, artist, book, poem, movie? Um, you know, books, books have been really helping me lately. And I think having the time um, to read and giving myself the time to read, because I've always loved reading and I used to be an avid reader, but um, you know, you get busy and you think you don't have time and, you know, you're you're so rushed to do everything and uh, it's hard to calm the mind anymore and um so books there's lots of books that have really helped me um uh i've been reading this book um about this neuroscientist he's a neuroscientist dr joe dispenza um becoming supernatural that's that's also been really helpful learning how to rewire your brain like, um, that's a whole other subject we can go to on another time because <laughs> that's really been eye opening too. It's just learning how to rewire your brain. You know, we get stuck in these patterns of thinking, think, you know, and when you relive an experience in your mind, your mind, your, your brain doesn't know that it's not happening again. Wow. Which I did not know. And so it makes sense to your body is like thinking this, this traumatic experience is happening again. So it's putting you right back into fight or flight and your adrenal glands are, you know, everything's running at full tilt and no body can survive under that. And so that just little piece of information has helped me just be more aware of where my mind goes and, and also just kind of probably what I've done to my body by reliving a lot of, you know, old memories. Wow. Um, I just read Untamed. <laughs> um, that was great. I, I flew through that one. Um, yeah, I, I'm reading so many different books right now. I've just picked up Artist's Way again because I read that, you know, many, many moons ago. Um, but really reading has been and and just kind of creating my new my, a new sound and, and new music. I cannot been, wait been. for like positive, uplifting <laughs> Angel Bond music because it's. I know that it'll be every bit as as um pure and energetic and filled with just positivity that's that's exciting Thank you. i'm so Thanks. excited for 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 Thank what you. you're you're going to be doing what you have done and um i just uh, i really am hoping for the best for you i'm hoping that you, you get through this everything's going to be great yeah it's going to be great i mean it i don't is. i'm i'm not going to be sitting there going like Oh, everything's going to be great. I want everything to, yeah. <laughs> I want everything to go well. In other yes. words, yeah. I don't want any surprises. Yeah. I want them to come up yeah. and say, okay, Me we found either. this. We took care of this. <laughs> and th- that's because there's no way the world needs what you've got to offer. And oh, um, thank you. Joseph. You're and, so sweet. And I think uh, everybody needs to go check out Cusses and understand, like, if you listen to it, Turn it up to 11 because <laughs> that's the way on. it needs to be heard. <laughs> <laughs> and and understand it, that, that everything you just heard from this person came through the, in that music. It's the same person. You won't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> oh, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and hear more, hear more about my story. It means a lot to me.